Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Acts chapter 16 and I'll be reading verses 6 through 10. I'm not going to read it right now, but if you will, if you have your Bible with you, put your finger right there and I'll be to it in just a second. Pray with me. Jesus, we get to be a part of this day and it's yours. Breathe your spirit on us gathered here that we know your strength, we know your power, and you reveal yourself through the reading of your word. What a great day this is. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The church where I grew up, there was a legend. And it wasn't a written legend. It wasn't even a spoken legend. It was a living legend. Her name was Ms. B. Dietrich. Ms. B. was my fifth grade Sunday school teacher. My sister, who's four years older than me, she was her fifth grade Sunday school teacher. My brother, who's seven years older than I am, she was his fifth grade Sunday school teacher. And if my parents had grown up in that same church, she would have been their fifth grade Sunday school teacher. If Moses had been in that same church, she would have been his fifth grade Sunday school teacher. She, she was so old, she referred to John the Baptist as Jack. I think they were in the same confirmation class or something. She... She remembers when the Dead Sea was only a little bit sick. Uh, she had been around for a long, long time. So I knew exactly what my mother meant when she said, Miss B's yard needs raking. What she meant was, get off the sofa, grab a rake, and go rake her yard. She didn't have to say all that. All she said was, Miss B's yard needs raking. So I grabbed a rake, went over to Miss B's yard, took a look at it, and... Um, I estimate about 80% of the leaves that fell in Georgia that year fell in Miss B's yard. <laughs> and she, she wanted them bagged. Oh, was, it was just raking and bagging for day after day after day. And I just got finished last week. And so I thought you should know. I just wanted to make an announcement. I, it, it, what, they weren't the kind of leaves, you know, that you do, like the, the pin oak or the water oak, where you just sweep up into great big piles and put them in a bag. No, this was sweet gum. And it stuck to the tines of the rake every time you raked it. And every afternoon... Ms. B would come out and she would have a little plate of, of butter cookies and, and pour cocoa in a Dixie cup and we would sit on her porch and we'd talk for a little minute before I went back to raking and bagging and raking and bagging. Well, when I was just about done, she brought out a little book with her and she gave it to me. And the title of the book was, If You Don't Know Where You're Going, You'll Wind Up Somewhere Else. <laughs> Isn't that a great title? I love the title. I don't remember anything about the book, but I do remember the title. If you don't know where you're going, you'll end up somewhere else. And I think that appeals to all of us. We are a people who, who love a plan, who love a, a, a sense of direction. We're folks who, who, who love, you know, planning our work and working our plan. And if, if you're focused, if you're centered, if you're, you have a sense of direction and you know where you're going, that's where you wind up. If you don't, well, you wind up somewhere else. One of the, one of the things I like best about our culture is 
that can do spirit, the can do spirit that that we we're, we we love it when folks are have a plan where they're focused, where they're centered, and they have a sense of direction. But then, several years later, I read this. This right here in Acts chapter 16. And it says, starting in verse 6, this is what it says. It says, and they, now who's the they that is being talked about right here? The they, that's Paul and Silas. That just a few verses before, Paul and Barnabas were, were going on a, a journey, and Barnabas said, well, let's bring along with us John Mark. Well, once before, John Mark had gone with them, and he deserted them. He, he left them in the middle of the, the journey, and Paul didn't want any part of that. He didn't want to have to depend on someone that he didn't know whether they were going to be there or whether they would, weren't. So Barnabas and Paul got kind of crossways with each other. So Barnabas and John Mark decided to go one direction, and Paul and Silas, the other. And the they that's being spoken of here is Paul and Silas in verse 8. It says, And they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come down to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Is this anyone's favorite verse in the Bible? Did you wake up this morning and go, I hope he talks about Phrygia because that just warms my heart. Somebody? Anybody? <laughs> Did anybody say, you know, I, I just so feel so spiritually full when he talks about Bithynia. And that miss you, you know, it just gets me going. Anybody? Chances are no. I, even if you've read this before, the chances are pretty good. You, you didn't know it was in there. It's kind of what we kind of consider, you know, often, you know, Bible filler. You know, the Bible is 66 books. You got to have filler in there somewhere and you read it along. And these, the names of these places, they really don't mean anything to us because, well, they're called something else nowadays. You might have recognized Asia. That's a pretty big place. And it starts talking about, you know, some of the places that Phrygia. Well, nowadays we call that Turkey. And Bithynia, that was a... That was, people in the ancient world, everyone would have known Bithynia because Bithynia was the richest province in Asia. A part of that in latter years would be called Istanbul and Constantinople before that. This was the, the major import-export route from, from, from Asia to Europe. And Paul had the eye of a strategist. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had a plan. He knew that if he planted the gospel there in Bithynia, while people were there for, for commerce, while they were trading, while they were buying, while they were selling, and, and, and they heard the gospel and Jesus transformed their lives with it when they went back home, that they would carry the gospel with them and to plant the gospel in Bithynia would be the same as planting the gospel all over the world because all of the world came to Bithynia. All of the world would be there and all of the world would hear the gospel if if he planted it in Bithynia, he was focused, he was centered, he had a sense of direction that Paul knew exactly what he was doing. But we read this morning that that's not where he wound up. Instead, he wound up somewhere else. It says, and passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Now, I was trying to figure out you know, what, what would be the modern equivalent of 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 wanting to go to the, that, that place that was perfect. There couldn't be any place better to plant the gospel and winding up in Troas. Well, imagine for a minute that your favorite radio station, they're having a contest, and all week long, they're going to they're gonna announce that whoever is the 10th caller will win an all-expense-paid trip to Cancun, Mexico, them and 10 of their friends. And, but you have to listen, and you have to listen all week long, and that, that if you're the 10th caller and you answer the question correctly, that you're going to win this trip. Well, you listen to the radio station anyway, but you happen to listen to it more intently 
that week than ever before, and they announce it. Whoever's the tenth caller wins an all-expense-paid trip. For them and ten of their friends to Cancun, Mexico, if you can answer the question and you call now. So you call in and you're the tenth caller. You're anxious about it and this is the question. What is the name of the horse in the movie Seabiscuit? Well, you happen to be smart that way. So you say Seabiscuit and the celebration begins. The, the horns and the sirens go off and everybody's celebrating that you've won this, this trip that everybody wants. You and 10 of your friends are going to Cancun, Mexico, and you can't wait. Well, the day comes that you and your friends are at your house waiting for the limo from the radio station to come and pick you up and take you to the airport so you can go to Cancun. And you all are talking about everything that you're going to do once you go to Cancun and how much fun it'll be. Memories of a lifetime. You're all prepared for that. And the, the limo rolls up and, and you and all your friends crowd into this limo. You, you knock on the limo, limo driver's window and he lowers the window and he says, how may I help you, sir? And you say, take us to Cancun, knowing that he's going to carry you to the airport and you're going to fly to Cancun, Mexico. And he says, yes, sir. And the window goes up and, and you all are talking about swimming with the dolphins. You're talking about the sun and the sand and all the things that you're going to do there in Cancun. And then you, it's been about an hour and you look outside the window and you go, well, this doesn't look like the airport. I mean, nobody's cut us off in traffic and there are, you know, it doesn't look the same at all. And so you knock on the window and the limo driver lowers the window and he says, how may I help you, sir? And you say, well, I thought we were going to the airport. I said, take us to Cancun. And he says, oh, I thought you said Calhoun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, now Calhoun is a nice place and I know there's some people watching today that are from Calhoun and you're a part of what makes it such a great place. But if you've got your heart set on Cancun, Calhoun won't do. Nobody ever swam with a dolphin in Calhoun. And if you want the sun and if you want the beach, yeah, Resaca Beach is there. But, you know, that not too many folks know about that. And they aren't going to be bragging to their friends. They aren't going to be thinking about, oh, the memories on Resaca Beach. But you, you wow. That's Troas. Troas is that place that you didn't plan on being. The place you never expected to be. That place you... You plan not to be. That's Troas. Paul. Paul. He, he was focused. He was centered. He was directed. And, and still he wound up in Troas. And if you, you see a map at Troas, there's no place to go from there. That's where the road ends. The only place left is to step off into the ocean or to go back where you came. And if you step off into the ocean, you can't look across the ocean and say, well, that's where we're going next. No, the only thing to do is get on a boat and go to the, somewhere else. This was not what he had planned on. This was not what he expected. This was not what he had hoped would happen. But hear the good news. Hear the good news. Starting in verse 8. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. In verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. That's when they went to Macedonia. And that's where Paul made the first convert in all of Europe. This is when the gospel spread to Europe. This is when he started the church in Philippi. A church that he would later write a letter that is one of the most encouraging, hopeful letters in, in all of the Bible. This is when he started the church in Thessalonica. It would be from here that he went to start the church in Athens. It would been, be from here that he went to start the church in Corinth. It was from this place that Paul, Paul, armed with the, the Spirit of Jesus, went in to, to spread the gospel on all of the world. God is faithful. 
God is faithful even in somewhere else. Even when we wind up in that place where we never hoped to be, the place we never thought to be, we would be, the place we never expected to be. Now, Troas has a lot of different names. Sometimes Troas is called the feet. That you had planned your work and worked your plan, but still you wound up in defeat. Troas has a lot of different names. Sometimes it's a layoff. Sometimes it's not what you expected. Sometimes it's a sickness or divorce or to death. It's called death. Hear the good news that in the Troas of life, even if somewhere else, God is faithful. God hasn't left you alone. God is there. It was on the cross. It was on the cross that Jesus gave his life in order to defeat all those things that would destroy us. To take away the power of all those things that would defeat us. To take away the power of, of, of defeat, of death, the power of sin. All those things we've done and all those things that were done to us. And he rose from the grave that his spirit might live in and through us. That, the, that he might give us life. The life, not the best life we can have, but his life lived through us. The spirit of Jesus alive in you and me. When we, when we receive it, this morning it may be that you are somewhere else. You are that place that you never planned to be, the place you never expected to be, the place you never hoped to be. Hear the good news. God is faithful. God is faithful. Philippians chapter 419. Paul later writes when he is that place where he never expected to be, the place he never hoped to be, the place he never planned to be, he was in prison. And it was there from prison that he writes to that church in Philippi, the church that he started right here. And he's writing to them to give them hope to give them encouragement, to let them know that God is faithful. And in Philippians 4.19, he says, My God shall supply all your needs. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Not some not many, but all according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That the power of the Holy Spirit that's available to you this day, not one day, but this day, even in that place you didn't plan to be, the place you hope not to be, the place you never expected. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, once again, we call on your help. We call on your strength because it's necessary for life. For way too long, we've been leaning on our own preparation, our own plans. But you never expected life to be... You never expected our lives to be limited by our plans, that your plans are greater than our plans, that your strength is greater than our strength. This day, Lord, I ask that you, you give us grace enough to, to pick up that strength, the strength that you give us freely that we walk in your spirit and we invite your spirit to walk in us, that we might know that strength and follow. Use this day to be a day of renewal, a day of refreshment, a day of power that comes from you. It's in Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image. And what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.